Is Twitter killing the novel? A Kindle that's just for reading? And unicorns let us stream our iPhone screens. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 352 for Thursday, June 4th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox. And you can connect Dropbox for Business with over 300,000 apps for project management. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney, and this is the show where we talk about tech news and tech culture with the most interesting writers out there. Joining me today is Hugh McGuire, co-editor of Book, A Futurist Manifesto. He's also the founder of Pressbooks, an online book publishing platform built on WordPress, and the founder of LibriVox, a totally free audiobook library of works, works in the public domain, read entirely by volunteers. He's also a self-described tech news hater. Welcome, Hugh. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm quite a tech news hater, but a uh, recovering tech news addict, let's say. <laughs> yes, we've been going back and forth how, about how much time gets absorbed by tech news. Uh, so you were just joking when you said you hated tech news, I'm sure. Uh, so we've been trying to have you on since last month when I read your mm -hmm. piece in Medium about why we can't read anymore. It's subtitled, Can Books Save Us from the Digital? What Digital Does to Our Brains. Uh, why don't you start by telling us everything important in the article because we've already forgotten how to read it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I read it all. Uh, and what I really, I, I didn't have trouble reading it, but I have trouble, like you said, of reading novels. It's just very difficult to focus now, and I just want to move on to the next thing. Why is it getting harder and harder for us to read? I don't know if it's exactly that it's getting harder and harder um, to read. Maybe uh, 50 years ago, people had the same problems with um, newspapers taking up their time or whatever. But I, I do think that digital devices, the way they sort of train us to um, always seek and expect new little blurbs or um, shots of information, whether it's email or Twitter or whatever, is uh, uh, is perhaps not reshaping our brain, but certainly training our brain to behave in, in ways that makes reading hard. And so I about, uh, well, I guess it was around January, I, I uh, sort of had this realization that I hadn't read very many books at all over the course of the year. And when I thought back on it, I really sort of uh, kept having this experience of starting books um, and just kind of uh, not being able to concentrate enough to finish that chapter and keep going. So I, you know, I probably started, I don't know, 40 books or something like that, but I, I only finished about four of them. And um, I just had this sense that my brain was not doing a very good job of focusing both um, on reading, also having the problem kind of at work and uh, I guess with my family and people around. So I thought I would sort of investigate this and, and see what I could do about it. Well, how can you be sure that you weren't just reading the wrong book? Because that's my problem. I'll, you know, I'll pick up a book that's been recommended to me and I'll, you know, it just, I'm not sure if it's me or if it's the book. Yeah, I think, so what happened was the four books that I did read were ones that were sort of home runs that really caught my attention. Um, but what I was noticing was books that I wanted to read but didn't quite have that same sort of adrenaline pull that, that, that the occasional book does. Um, I just wasn't getting through them. And I guess, you know, reading's always been a huge pleasure of mine. And I just had this realization that, that something was just kind of out of balance and I wanted to make uh, a bit more time for reading. And I sort of had this hypothesis that, that part of this sort of fractured focus, um, I could perhaps um, part of my retraining myself to, to focus was going to be finding ways to read books from beginning to end, not necessarily in one sitting, but, but not sort of dropping them halfway through the way I had been doing uh, over the past year anyway. Right. And, I mean, and this probably dates back, you know, uh, five, five years or, or more that I've sort of noticed this, this, but really last year was a peak for me of a peak or, or whatever the opposite of a peak is. <laughs> Right. I mean, you describe it's not just with books, it's with your with your kids um, and it's experience that so many of us have. You're experiencing this wonderful uh, moment. Yours was your two year old daughter's ballet recital and you couldn't stop thinking about the phone in your pocket, the way it felt and what was on it. I've definitely been there. So it, it's, it isn't just books. It, it was everything. So what, yeah, what's what's absolutely. going on in our brains 
than uh, when we're thinking about checking email or reading random news articles? Yeah, there's kind of there's a bit of a controversy, uh, and certainly after I wrote my article, I was leaning on a few books that I had read as I was sort of trying to cure myself, I guess, the, the self help cure. But um, books that are looking at how cognitive um, n cognitive neuroscience and what recent research is is showing, and there's still a bit of controversy about exactly what processes are happening. But it certainly seems to me, and it's backed up by uh, a lot of the research out there, that digital sort of triggers certain kinds of responses to us are not digital, but but things like tweets and um, email where we have uh, uh, a, a built-in um, sort of pleasurable response to finding new information, the potential of new information, seeking new information. So all these kinds of um, digital inputs that we have um, do trigger uh, a response to us uh, or a response in our brains. And uh, the, the catchphrase right now is dopamine, which is uh, related to pleasure. It's related to um, seeking new information. It's maybe related to addiction. Uh, but this idea is that when... Uh, you know, you see something pop up, an unread email in your inbox that that is, your brain is just drawn to that in a very <laughs> intense way. And that's certainly what, what I felt. Um, and, you know, the, the, uh, I, I, again, I, there was some con controversy and I had some people criticizing some of the, the science of that, but I, I was just thinking about that, um, you know, the, the problems people have texting and driving, which is something that uh, I, hesitate to admit uh, in a public forum, but, um, you know, every once in a while I'm at a red light and there I am just because I have to know what's in my email at the red light in the three seconds, like to what purpose, there's no purpose, but you feel this draw. So there's clearly something going on in the mind that's, that's pulling us out of whatever we're doing uh, to just see, oh, is there something new uh, in, in my iPhone or on my uh, desktop or laptop or whatever. Right. I mean, it's like impulse control because you know it's not that important. You know it's not worth your life or any of the people in your car's <laughs> life. But, you know, yeah. suddenly we turn into teenagers where we're like, we have to know. We can't, you know, something switches off. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something very, I mean, to me, it's clear that there's something very biological going on there. Um, and so, again, my my article was about this process of trying to train myself to, to step out of that um, and to take time away from it. Uh, and particularly reading because it's kind of the opposite. Reading, you know, you have to start um, and, and maintain focus over, over a sustained period of time. And uh, so, yeah, so that's kind of the training exercise I've been doing uh, with myself um, uh, to try to cure this and also the, this wonderful benefit of, of taking time to read again, which has been a wonderful experience. So describe a little bit about the rules you made for yourself starting in January. <sighs> Yeah, right. I, I'm not sure how closely uh, the I guess the the irony is that article was a very um, uh, you know got an awful lot of response, and all of a sudden I spent a week checking my Twitter and Facebook messages and and medium stats to see who was reading it and who was tweeting about it, which <laughs> sort of blew my whole program for a while. But um, so the rules are things like I don't check Twitter uh, during work. Um, don't check Facebook. I try to avoid as much as possible reading news articles. You know, I find I'm interested in all sorts of things. And when I'm trying to do something else, it's always so much easier to, oh, all of a sudden you're reading an article about, um, uh, what did I mention in the, art <laughs> in the article I was writing, but Mandelbrot theory or, you know, the latest uh, tech news or whatever. And so I tried to restrict the amount of news that I'm reading. Um, stopped watching TV after dinner. That was kind of the the biggest thing because, uh, you know, that was eating up a certain amount of time. And then th the, the, the other side of that is taking, um, as soon as I finish dinner, I take an hour or two to just get in bed and start reading. And, and that, that's been the biggest thing is just really making the time where um, I don't sort of allow myself to want to be doing other things. I know that I'm there to be reading. So it's, you know, it's almost like going to the gym or doing yoga or something. It just, it just becomes that's, that's what I'm doing in this in this time period after after I eat. Right, it's a practice that you have to be mindful right. about yeah. and set that you're really going to do it. Yeah, and and there was a big shift there. What you alluded to at the beginning is it used to be I would sort of sit and start reading and be waiting for you know if the book wasn't really grabbing me, then I would sort of say oh this isn't as good as 
you know, an article that I might be reading. And instead now the reading, book reading has become kind of, as you say, like a, a practice. And so that's just what I'm doing for that time. And so it allows me to sort of slow down and switch off this desire um, for other kinds of things and spend time just, just reading, uh, reading longer form stuff. So you mentioned that you read four books last year. And since January, since you've been sort of keeping to this, how many books have you read? Yeah, I think I'm up to uh, 22. Um, so I've, I've done well. <laughs> So what are a couple of your favorites that you've read so far? Yeah, so so uh, um, I guess a, a, a great one that I read was, um, and I have to look at my notes to remember the exact title, it's called The Grand Design by uh, Stephen Hawking. Um, so it's about uh, the latest in uh, cosmology and, and what the universe looks like. And uh, I guess the flip side of that, and so that's, you know, a fairly deep, heavy book that I probably would have struggled with last year. Um, and then the the... Other book that I read that, that I really enjoyed was The Martian by Andy Weir, which is, I think, just about any um, addict of Twitter or whatever would have trouble putting that book down to check anything else out because it's, uh, it's really a fantastic book. So uh, let's talk about ebook readers. This week, Amazon mm -hmm. announced a kids bundle for $99. You get the latest Kindle without sponsored screensavers, a kid friendly cover, and a two year warranty. And one of the most interesting features I found is that it only has books, no apps or other distractions. Uh, what do you think of this? Yeah, I mean, to me, this that was one of the biggest uh, changes that I made um, when I first started reading eBooks, um, and still to this day, I, I really love the experience of reading on on my phone. So I've got an iPhone, uh, and I, I I love the the format. I find it's great for long form. The problem with smartphones and tablets, it's they're connected to all these tempting other things that you might be doing. Um, so I've started myself the, the change. I, I don't read so much in, in paper and print anymore, but, um, but uh, a, a dedicated e-ink reader. And so I think, I think it's, um, you know, the, the not having all that stuff, which seemed to me to be maybe a, a bug of, um, uh, the e-ink readers, I didn't think they can compete with uh, how valuable it was to just have your phone in your pocket or whatever it is. Um, but really, I think that's a feature in the end is the fact that it's just a book. And, you know, my uh, I've got a I've got a few different devices, but I use a, a Kindle that's got um, access to the web. But it's it's uh, if you've got a Kindle e-ink or any e-ink um, reader that accesses the web, you know that that's not a pleasant <laughs> experience, and there's not quick hits of digital there. So, um, so I think that's a great idea that that if uh, you know making that transition to e-reading, um, that having a dedicated reader that doesn't have anything else on it is, uh, ends up being a, a great feature to allow you to focus and, and not be distracted and tempted by all the other stuff you might be doing. Right. I mean, the first when I saw it, I was like, that would be great for my kids because I don't let them read on the iPad because I mm -hmm. frankly can't trust them not to just play Minecraft <laughs> yeah. instead. Yeah, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't trust myself not to. Right. I know. When you made so, that yeah, point, I was like, I don't know that I can really trust myself. It's true. I mean, when we first got our Kindle, it had the physical keyboard at the bottom of it. And I didn't even like that. I didn't, it wasn't yeah. really connected to the web except for to buy books, but I didn't even like seeing the keyboard when I was reading. Mm -hmm. um, and I still don't. I still like the paper books made yep. from trees, feel them in my hands. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to say my, uh, it's it's funny because the I think digital reading and, and ebooks, um, that they're, uh, they offer an awful lot um, in terms of convenience and all sorts of things. And, and in fact, I, I have trouble reading paper now. Um, but, uh, but definitely for me, the dedicated e-reader is the way to go to, to keep the um, lines of communication as closed as possible. So let's talk about LibriVox. It's a project you started in 2005 to get volunteers around the world to make digital audio recordings of every existing public domain book and then offer them mm -hmm. to free to the world. I love LibriVox. I found it in 2008. I think I talked oh. about it on a parenting podcast that I did on this mm -hmm. network back then. Uh, my 10-year-old boys, they still fall asleep every night listening to LibriVox. They oh, um, great. love it. Uh, it's really the only thing that's changed is the d different devices that they'll listen to it on or what they're yeah. streaming it to. So tell me how and why you started LibriVox. Um, how and why? Yeah, it was. Uh, I was really interested in the open source software movement. I'm not uh, a developer, um, exactly. Uh, and I was really interested in the open software movement, uh, at the time, creative commons and the open, uh, culture movement was kind of, um, uh, quite 
well known and famous. And uh, I love audio. I've always loved audio. And and it just seemed to me there was a big uh, project. Gutenberg was a huge library of free public domain texts. And it just seemed to me, oh, wouldn't it be nice if there was also a free library of audio books? And there wasn't. So I I uh, I just kind of it was one of those projects that just put up on a, on a blog, got some uh, traction for it quickly from a handful of people. And then it, it just sort of grew and grew. And now LibriVox puts out about um, 1,200 books a year. There's a catalog of 8,000 books in languages from Church Slavonic and Old Sudanese and German and French and English. Um, and it's really been uh, just amazing to watch the engagement that um, that, that uh, relatively small but still deeply passionate community of volunteers dedicates to uh, creating audiobooks and giving them away for free. So it's, uh, it's a, a um, I guess, something I'm very proud of, although, um, uh, you know, most, most of the work is done by lots of other people who spend a lot of time making audiobooks for the world. So how can people volunteer if they want to read something on LibriVox? Um, so we have a, a forum, which is still run on an old PHP BB forum from like the old days. And uh, uh, if you go to LibriVox, there's some instructions on how to volunteer. And then there's sort of a process generally that there's a, it's a very friendly and um, uh, welcoming community. So uh, you just post somewhere on the forum and say, hey, I'd like to volunteer. And someone will uh, walk you through the steps or point you in the right direction and um, uh, this kind of built up a system of, of how to do it and how to get people going. So it's, um, uh, uh, as I say, a friendly place um, to, uh, to volunteer and, and people are very helpful in getting people started there. And um, you, I should say that if people think that they're, all the good books have been taken, you also let people record books that have already been taken. There are many, several different yeah, readings of the same book. There's, exactly, yeah. The, the, the principle was... Um, Really, with LibriVox, the focus has always been on on giving joy to the people who are volunteering, and uh, I've always liked to say that the fact that the world gets a free um, library of audiobooks is kind of a fringe benefit, um, and that the main thing we do is just help people record stuff they love. So there are lots of um, lots of popular books that have all sorts of versions. Um, so absolutely. And you also founded the... And, and oh, I, I should just say, um, you needn't record a whole book. You can just record one chapter. So so the way it works is um, some books are done, just one person doing the whole thing, but a book will get posted and say, we're looking for uh, volunteers to read a chapter of this book. And you can go through a list of all the books with available chapters and, and pick one you like and just read one and test it out and, and learn the ropes. And um, um, about half the catalog now is uh, solo recordings, but, but half is still... Um, collaborative with lots of different people chipping in. So you also have an audiobook company, you founded an audiobook company called Iambic. Is that a for-profit company? <laughs> yeah, so I, the idea behind Iambic was to um, take some of the um, uh, some of the principles behind LibriVox, but um, uh, a, a use those to, to make a uh, for-profit um, commercial audiobook publisher. And we do... Um, uh, it's mostly s small independent books, and then we also do some production work for, for other publishers. And Pressbooks, is your, you're busy. You have mm -hmm. a lot of different projects. Pressbooks is your online yeah. book publishing platform based on WordPress. Uh, how does yeah. Pressbooks work? Yeah, Pressbooks, so it's, uh, I th as you say, it's an online system that looks a lot like WordPress because it's built on top of it. We use that as use pre uh, WordPress as a, um, a development platform, and it cre uh, you sort of use it, I guess, as you would a blog, but uh, there's an export button that exports your books in um, typeset PDFs uh, ready for print on demand, as well as all the ebook formats. So we uh, try to make uh, publishing books easy. Well, as they say, everybody has a book in them. I don't know whether that's true, but if you know if you have one, there's, there's no barrier to publish it anymore. I I, he I heard a stat, I, I, I've never actually seen it confirmed, but uh, that a larger percentage of people um, in a survey done a few years ago uh, wanted to write a book than had actually read a book in the, <laughs> the previous year. So <laughs> That sounds about right. Well, Hugh McGuire, mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us. You're the founder of Pressbooks and LibriVox. Uh, what are you working on now that you can talk about? Uh, mostly Pressbooks is, is main focus and I try to keep the other things going and uh, actually um, sort of uh, want to be doing a bit more writing about, about 
um, the stuff that the uh, I was writing about in, in that Medium article. So I'm uh, hoping to do a few more articles about that, and maybe I'll turn that into a book eventually. And you have a newsletter also that people can sign up yes. for. We can put yes. that link in the show notes if people are sure, interested yeah, in this I topic. I don't even can. know what the link is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, You Take care. Okay. Thanks, Megan. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Coming up, big companies want to know everything about us, and we're all like, meh. Plus, why you might want to invite a drone to your wedding. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Dropbox. If you're watching this, I probably don't have to tell you what Dropbox is. We've been using it here at Twit since forever, but we recently upgraded to something even better. It's Dropbox, Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business is the better way to manage accounts, manage billing, and have visibility and control over your data. Dropbox for Business lets you do just that, and you don't have to waste time finding a different solution. It's the same easy Dropbox experience your employees already love and trust, which means less training and more productivity. Simple storage and sharing for any type of file on any platform and any device. Dropbox for Business never runs out of space. Each user starts off with one terabyte, and it's easy to expand. Here's what I use my one terabyte for. I do a lot of demos. I take a lot of screenshots. I take them on my PC and my phone. I even take them on my watch. And when I do, Dropbox immediately stores them and then gives me a link. And I don't have to worry about clogging up a bunch of space on my phone or my laptop. It's really nice. I can send those screenshot links to editors and producers, and we can collaborate and control access to the content. Dropbox for Business has powerful admin controls like remote wipe, intuitive sharing, and permission controls, plus complete audit logs. Here's where the part where I get to use the big words. Dropbox for Business integrates with third-party security and administration solutions such as SIM, DLP, and eDiscovery. And the Dropbox for Business infrastructure uses encryption for file data in transit and at rest, plus segmentation and hashing to anonymize files. Give it a try. Sign up for Dropbox for Business. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial of Dropbox for Business. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Wired reports that there's a new iOS app called Unicorns that lets you plug in your phone or tablet and live stream what you're doing on the screen. Because why embarrass someone by tweeting a screenshot of your personal chat when you could live stream it and embarrass them as it happens? Now we've talked about the live stream apps Periscope and Meerkat that let you live stream the video you take from your phone, but this might be taking it a little step, one step too far. Wired says that there are practical uses for Unicorn besides narcissism and cyberbullying. App developers can use it to test apps. Gamers can use it to show people how to get past tough levels. Maybe Leo and I will even use it on iOS today to live stream from our iPhones and our iPads because what's the worst that can happen? Recode pointed us to a new feature in Facebook Messenger that gives us a new way of sending your location directly to a friend as well as the locations of places where you want to meet your friends. All you have to do is tap the more icon, that's those three little dots, or the location pin at the bottom of your screen. In a blog post on their site, Facebook says, if you want to tell a friend which restaurant to meet you at, search for the restaurant and send a map of where it is. If you're running late, you can send a map of where you are to your friend and let him or her know how far away you are. They also say the feature is rolling out now. When I checked this afternoon, I did not see the more icon just yet. And Recode's Kurt Wagner surmises that this might be the first step toward Messenger's ride-sharing integration with Uber and Lyft. The New York Times revealed that the new Annenberg study says that people don't like data mining, but they feel powerless to do anything about it. I am with you people. I don't like it either. But have you seen how good Google Photos is? And do you know how entertaining it is to watch videos of goats in pajamas on Facebook? So I like watching videos of goats in pajamas. Obviously, I don't care if anyone knows about that because I've said it just on the podcast. Now everyone knows. But I get it. All this data collection is creepy in a way that many of us can't even wrap our minds around. A month ago, a viewer pointed me to Eli Parsier's book, The Filter Bubble. I've been listening to it, and I highly recommend it to anyone who wants to know more about the inner workings of data collection. I want to know what you think. What kind of service is worth the trade-off of your personal data? Let me know. Um, I am on Twitter at Megan Maroney. Android Central says that some Chrome for Android users are reporting that they can now highlight text and get access to other search results without leaving the page they're on. The feature is called Touch to Search, and it is apparently, apparently coming to an Android device near you thanks to a server-side update from Google. Android Central says this is an opt-in feature, and you can bet that they're keeping track of what you're searching for. And finally, are you planning on getting married anytime soon? If so, you might want to check Mashable's Complete Guide to Shooting Your Wedding by Drone. Samantha Murphy Kelly says you might be able to convince your wedding photographer or videographer to tack on a drone package for as little as 200 extra dollars. 
but the price could be as high as a grand. I think that's kind of bananas. Do you know how many times I watched my wedding video? This is not my wedding video, by the, by the way. I watched my wedding video exactly zero times. Of course, it was on VHS, and it was done by a college friend's husband who was very drunk. So maybe a drone would have been a better idea for me. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. You can leave a comment on iTunes. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell strangers sitting next to you on the bus, and watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. If you want to watch the show in person, you can send an email to tickets at twit.tv. You can also follow me on Twitter. I am at Megan Maroney. Today I flipped the magic switch to accept direct messages from anyone, not just the people I follow. Please do not let me regret that I did that. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.